I'm sorry, we were launching the same place, you know, we don't agree, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway, thanks very much. See us, we will come on Tuesday. We will come on Tuesday next week. Yeah, yeah, it'll pick you up, don't worry. No, it doesn't feel like it, but it does. Um, hello, everybody, and um, good evening. Uh, welcome to Res Publica's last uh, fringe of the evening. And before we sally forth to uh, make friends and uh, we thought we'd begin, or rather end, with uh, an event on cohesion and integration. So, the title of this session is Immigration and Integration in Civic Life. And before I begin, I'd like to thank British Future and the Barrow Cadbury Trust for helping to support this, which is very uh, good of them. So, um, first uh, to speak, and uh, on my left, is Damien Green, former Minister for Immigration, now Joint Minister for the Home Office and Ministry of Justice, effectively the Police Minister, he tells me. And you all know uh, Damien, he's um, had many roles since he was elected in 1997, and he was Opposition Spokesman for Education, Employment and Environment. And uh, Damien and I have been, have been chatting over the years now, and it's always been a pressing uh, concern, I think, for Damien, uh, the question of cohesion, how we create for new migrants ways in which uh, people and their communities and families can be integrated most successfully in, in, into Britain. So thank you for coming, Damien. Really appreciate it. On, uh, on Damien's uh, uh, left, uh, we have Lord Poppet, <coughs> co-chairman of the Conservative Friends of India. And uh, Lord Poppet came over from Uganda with the 35,000 Ugandan Asians after uh, one of the travails of uh, Idi Amin and the contribution from this group to British life, uh, economic and social, has been unprecedented and we're just absolutely we're very grateful to have him here. He's an advocate of community cohesion and the importance of reconciling and uniting different cultures under the UK's central democratic process. And Lord Popper has been actively involved with the Conservative Party since the 1980s, serving both Mrs Thatcher and John Major. So thank you very much for coming. And on uh, my right we have Sundar Katwala, who was previously director of the Fabians and now runs British Future, which is non-partisan. And I think he's doing some really interesting breakthrough work on institutional integration um, in our country. So thank you very much um, for coming, Sunda. Uh, I'm Philip Blond. Uh, I'm the chairman, and I'm not the chairman, I'm the director of Res Publica. So a great pleasure to welcome you here. So without further ado, I'd ask, like to ask Damien uh, to begin. Thank you very much, Philip. And, and thanks, as ever, to Res Publica uh, for putting on a, a fascinating uh, fringe programme, which genuinely does raise the tone of debate at uh, a party conference, which we should all be grateful for. Um, I want to talk about um, being British uh, in 2012, because this has been a problem that has exercised politicians across the political spectrum for a long time. I remember Gordon Brown tried to sort of grapple with it, and you may remember uh, he was suggesting that people should fly the Union Jack on their front lawn and stuff like that. It's something clodhoppingly un-British, uh, it, it, it seemed to me. Um, but I, I don't blame him for, for trying to grasp the nettle, because it, it, it does need grasping, and, it, and it's not easy. I remember at the start of the financial crisis in 2008, uh, I was with uh, a group of German friends at a conference, and we, and we were discussing national identity and the differences between different types of, of national identity in democracies. You know, in many ways, you, you start producing lists of desirable things about democracy and the rule of law and the ability to change governments peacefully and a free press and all that kind of thing. Well, you know, all of that is part of British life, but it's also part of German life. Uh, so what was the difference between us? And the best I could come up with uh, was it was at the height of the, the Northern Rock crisis. Uh, and I said, if you want a definition of Britishness, and indeed Britishness at its best, it was that there was a run on a bank, 
and at five o'clock on Friday, this queue of anxious people at the door were told that it was five o'clock on Friday and the bank was closing and would they come back at nine o'clock on Monday morning? And they did. That's Britishness for you. That would not have happened uh, in many other countries. Um, but what we've had uh, in the course of uh, this year and over the past few months, uh, of course, has been one of the national events we will all genuinely remember for a long time to come, uh, the Olympics. And I think that did, among the very many good things it did, it did actually restart the debate um, about uh, Britishness. Um, it, and, and as I say, Gordon Brown tried to, 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 to grapple with it a few years ago. Um, he had to because of the, uh, the nature and, and sheer scale of immigration under the, the Labour government. You know, regardless of where you stand on that, I don't particularly want to talk about uh, immigration policy uh, this evening, but it, it's just unarguable that the numbers were completely unprecedented, that we were getting uh, net migration of a quarter of a million a year, which means you need to build a new city the size of Birmingham every five or six years just to cope with, with new people, and at a time of unbelievably and unprecedentedly rapid change like that, then people do start thinking about well, what does it mean to be British, what are our, our habitual points of, of national reference. And of course, the, um, a lot of the debate sparked by the Olympics was about the opening ceremony, uh, which was attacked by a small number of people for being uh, multicultural. And it seems to me that the exact opposite uh, was the truth. Uh, the reason the opening ceremony was such a success was that actually it was monocultural. It was British culture. Uh, it, it revealed, and indeed it, it reveled in, the sheer breadth and depth of modern British culture. So there was Shakespeare, there was Brunel, there were Village Greens, there was the Industrial Revolution, there was the NHS, there was a lot of rock music, there was a lot of grime, the music, not the actual problems uh, in urban uh, places. And all of them actually play a, a legitimate part in our national pageant. Um, and, and what it was doing was revealing the variegated nature of modern Britishness to the world. And it, this was, it was brilliantly summed up by, by Dizzy Rascal. Uh, there is not another country in the world that would have its most famous rock, uh, rap singer uh, produce his biggest hit called Bonkers. There cannot be a more British word than bonkers. Everyone who read schoolboy fiction in the 50s and 60s uh, will recognise it, and that was the title of Britain's most famous <laughs> rap song. Um, so, um, the phrase I've used before, you know, Britain passed the Danny Boyle test, if you like, and, and, and we all have to, and the Conservative Party uh, has to pass the Danny Boyle test. It has to be comfortable um, in modern Britain. Because it, it should go without saying, but clearly it doesn't, that Britishness has changed over the centuries. And, and any Tory who cares about British history, which all good Tories will, uh, should accept this. And it's quite interesting to note the changes uh, over the centuries. It is now possible, in a way it wasn't once, to be a patriotic Brit and a Catholic, which is good for people like me, who are Catholics. Um, it's now possible, which it wasn't in previous centuries, to be an absolutely patriotic Brit and not a Christian, which is lucky for Mo Farah, uh, who became a national hero uh, over the summer. Um, it's possible, which it wasn't in previous centuries, to be uh, a patriotic Brit and not white, which is lucky for half the England football team. Um, and, of course, it's possible to be a patriotic and good British citizen without being born here. Uh, when I was immigration minister, I used to ask every audience, I'll do it now, how many of you have at least one parent born outside this country? Yeah, this, 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 is, this is not surprising. No. Thank you. Uh, it, there is always, and unless you ask people, audiences over the age of 60, uh, any audience under that, there is a significant proportion, and the younger you get, the more it is. When I ask student audiences this, it's often half uh, the audience there. So modern Britain is made up of people who come, to some extent, from other parts uh, of the world. So what does it mean? You know, all those things you used to have to be to be British, you don't have to be anymore. So let's turn to the positive. What, what you do have to do, it seems to me, is to be committed to the underlying values, habits and institutions of Britain. They're not immutable and over time they evolve. But 
the national discussion that leads to the evolution of our institutions and habits is itself a key factor of Britishness. Um, that discussion is often raucous, it's occasionally rancorous, but it's a discussion between free individuals, each of whom has a right to their say. Uh, it's not violent, uh, it doesn't incite violence, and if the changes to the institutions require changes to the law, then those laws are changed in Parliament and signed into effect by the monarch. You're free in a British democracy to campaign to change all of this. But if you want to change it, you have to change it using these rules. Uh, and if you reject these rules, then you're not, I submit, being British. That's not good Britishness. And this basic rule of political and social discourse is only one way in which being British differs uh, from being a citizen of any other uh, advanced democracy. As I, as I said, uh, in, in the context of discussion with German friends, we share huge numbers of uh, values. But every country uh, has its own subtle distinctions, and so do we. And, and I'll finish just by, by talking about the, the new uh, Life in the UK test, which the Home Office is about to produce, and in particular, the, the document that goes with it, which uh, was introduced by the previous Labour government, and which we're changing uh, very radically, because we think it doesn't uh, properly address this idea um, of Britishness. The, two, the previous guide, or the existing guide, um, is far too much about how you interact with the state, um, and not enough about the wider context uh, of Britishness. So the new document will give a proper sense of British history, so that new Brits can understand how Britain has grown into what it is today. Uh, the guide is unashamedly patriotic uh, and explains the daily life of British citizens, including cultural and leisure activities, so that no new citizen should feel tempted to stick with a parallel culture, to live in this country geographically, but not live in this country uh, culturally, because if you do that, then that's the way to an unhealthy society. And some of the sections of the new guide give a, give a flavour to its overall direction. They include the values and principles of the UK, a long and illustrious history, a modern thriving society, and the UK government, the law, and your role. So that will set out the fundamental principles, democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, tolerance of those uh, with different faiths and beliefs, and <coughs> participation in community life. And a, a final thought, uh, of course, these principles can't just be motherhood and apple pie. They have to actually stop some behaviours as well as encourage other behaviours, otherwise uh, they are pointless. So even though we're a variegated society, we need some taboos, or we do just become uh, parallel societies. And, it, and it's those taboos that will cause the, the problems uh, in, in terms of <coughs> actually telling people, no, uh, we won't permit that. For example, uh, one obvious example is Sharia law. Um, we cannot have different sets of laws applying to different people in this country. Uh, and I say this in, in this, uh, the newly topical phrase of one nation, which uh, Ed Miliband is certainly trying to nick from people like me, uh, who've been one nation politicians all our lives. Um, if you have one nation, one of the things you need is one set of laws, which, every, which apply to everyone, uh, regardless of how rich and poor they are, uh, regardless of their religion, uh, regardless of their uh, political beliefs. So having separate legal systems uh, in one country uh, cannot be allowed uh, to happen. There will be others that, that people will think of. But I think um, it's, I, I hope that this a new Life in the UK handbook will provoke <coughs> further discussions um, about Britishness. Because the more we can update our permanent values so that they reflect the contemporary way of life that we have uh, in this country, the more likely we are to continue with the, the atmosphere that surrounded uh, the country during the Olympics, which was a relaxed and coherent society. That's the sort of society Britain is at its best uh, and can be all the time, and that seems to me a huge prize for every citizen of this country, whatever their background. Thank you very much, uh, Damien. Much to discuss, uh, especially uh, 
the notion of the Olympics opening ceremony being monocultural, which I think is right. Sunder. Thanks, thank, thanks, Philip. Thanks, Mr. Publica, for um, inviting me. Uh, British Future is quite a new organisation. We launched this January, very much wanting to open up public debate, engage people more on some of the issues that can be most heated, most polarised, sometimes most toxic in our society, such as identity, integration, immigration an opportunity, but actually show that people want to discuss them, and given the chance to discuss them, we think we'll want to work out how we build a common future. So for that, that reason, we've been looking a lot at uh, how people have been thinking about 2012, and right at the start of the year, we, we found, uh, we produced an initial report called Hopes and Fears, that actually people are very anxious, obviously at the start of this year, about the economy, about the state of Europe, actually about lots of uh, questions in society, but also quite hopeful that it would be a year of national uh, occasions and celebrations. And we've gone back and found out how people felt the summer changed, how they thought about the society they lived in. There was, you know, a lot of good news in terms of what people felt was going on this summer. Uh, uh, eight out of ten people think it has made us prouder to be British. Uh, three quarters of people say it showed that we we're a confident and multi-ethnic uh, country. And uh, two thirds of people, which I thought was interesting, said they were surprised by how much it brought people together. I think perhaps some people were surprised, but it made me wonder how did we get to the position where it actually felt that we were kind of surprised that we could even hold the Olympic Games at all without it all ending up being sort of transport chaos over here and security uh, chaos over there. And there was a sort of sense that it was all in the balance till the very, uh, you know, day before and Mitt Romney came along and said, you know, I'm not sure, not sure you guys are ready, which, you know, it's very helpful, I think, to you know, bring people together at that moment. But, uh, we are a bit miserable sometimes, I think, just about the sort of foundational piece. You know, people phone me up saying, is it going to happen? It's just in London, isn't it? What do people think? And actually, you could say to them, well, look what's going on with the torch, actually. The torch is bringing people together. It's actually meaning that people are carrying the torch are probably, you know, unsung contributions that they've made and now getting a moment of recognition. And actually, whole, whole communities are coming out just to mark the moment of that torch passing through and their connection into a national event. And that came obviously on the back of the, you know, tens of thousands of street parties that people held for the uh, Jubilee <coughs> as well. And there's just that sense that partly because we've become a more individualistic <coughs> society in many ways, these moments that bring people together actually, there's a real appetite for them and a real sense <coughs> that they are actually quite important. So I think there was lots of good news. So it's important to be clear, it's not good news that settles any of the questions that people find, uh, you know, difficult or that they're anxious about. I mean, immigration is still going to be a very, very tough issue for, uh, you know, any government to secure public trust for the choices you make that are workable and that, and that people want. And it's often, uh, you know, a very heated <laughs> debate. Actually, there is, as, um, I mean, Damien Green's now, you know, might be relieved to be out of the job. But, I mean, I found whenever I talked about people, you could talk to anybody anywhere on the spectrum, Damien. They always had a lot of respect for the way you were handling the policy, but actually the way you were, uh, the discourse that you were that you were leading to try and say, actually, how do people come together about the choices that they want to make? What choices are in Britain's national interest? What choices reflect our values? And even people who disagreed about them, I think, you know, there's a lot of hidden agreement anyway on the, on the choices you make. Most people are in favour of students coming in to study. Most people think that you need skilled immigration as part of your economy. People feel that once you're in the European Union, you're not going to have a lot of unskilled immigration from everywhere else by the nature of having, you know, the size of the European Union and so on. And I think, you know, everybody in this country or very large majority of people in this country think refugee protection has always mattered and will still matter. So actually, in a funny way, one of our most heated debates, and actually you then ask people what they want to change and they want different numbers, but actually there's quite a lot of common ground on it. Um, integration, though, I think, which is important, is a different issue to immigration, and too often we've treated it as the same thing. So that it's, of course, important that immigration affects integration, the scale and pace of change and what you have to do and so on. But actually, when you're talking about two or three generations of uh, uh, post-war immigration, we too often sort of said, well, if you know you get your immigration policy right, well, you know, hopefully integration will work out. And I think integration requires more intervention. There's a funny thing about integration, though, which is that you always notice it when it isn't happening. You always notice the bad news and the trouble spots. And I think it's quite right that governments should focus on the bad news and the trouble spots. And I think there are parts of our country where, you know, they're quite polarised, quite separate communities, and things are going quite badly, and it needs quite a lot of intervention. The thing about integration is you don't notice it where it is working. And so you risk being too sort of pessimistic about what's going on, which is that this country actually has a very 
successful history, actually, of immigration and integration, but you don't stop back and see it because it, it integrates uh, into it. And actually, so Team GB itself is an important uh, model of this, actually. I did some research into the medal table to look at the medal winners. And uh, just as Damien has done with his show of hands there, um, a, over a third of the medals reflected the last three generations of immigration and integration into this uh, society in the sense that you had uh, a winning athlete whose grandparent or parent or they themselves had been born abroad. And that's not a surprise. You think Jessica Ennis's dad as much as Mo Farrell or Robbie Grabert's grandfather came over from Poland at the start of the century. But you, in TGB you see the layers of how British society was made up. But that's exactly the right, that's exactly the number you'd expect. Because that's actually how our society was made up. So we're always anxious and, you know, right, you say about whether we're getting it right uh, you know, at this moment, but we're actually able to absorb immigration uh, by integration that we were very anxious about. So we now see the Jewish community, Ugandan Asian communities as, you know, model integrative communities that we could all learn a lot from. It wasn't actually what people said at the moment, which was much more um, anxious. So I think we should take some confidence that we can deal with the tough issues, and you have to go to the difficult issues in the communities that isn't working and put your efforts there, but we should take confidence in what we should do. But I think there's another lesson from this summer which I'd like to end on, which is that I think we have too much of a debate about them and us. Can they become us? When actually the story is that they have been becoming us. Actually, ethnic minorities in the country have a slightly stronger level of Britishness than the white community. It always comes up in surveys, newspaper, always surprised. It's not surprising, of course, if you come to a new country, make your life there, bring up your children there. So we've kind of been more anxious than we need to be, as long as we're anxious enough to do something about getting it right. But the way we talk about it as policy, sort of multiculturalism, which I've always found a quite unhelpful term, because it means there are different communities and cultures. If you're of mixed background, my, my mother's from Southern Ireland and my father's from India, so there's not a kind of group of community leaders for me, and I might, <laughs> you know, be after them if there, if there was, and so on. You know, you've got, and, you know, actually people of mixed race background will be larger in the net census than any of the individual minorities. What you've got to do is make the common space reflect all of the trajectories that people have to it, not hope to sort of find different ways to represent the more. And, you know, Danny Bill's story showed how we can do it. You do it not by talking about, I think, community cohesion or multiculturalism or, you know, policy words. You do it by finding the moments that bring people together and making sure that they're fully inclusive of the whole country, as the Olympic Games did. So what I'd like to see us do is find the moments that work like that and make sure we understand the history that got us here. And I think the next great national moment uh, for us all to share uh, as we start to wear poppies this November is that we're coming up to the centenary of the Great War in uh, 2014. And that, I think, is a profoundly important moment in British history. And I think it tells, you can tell a lot of family stories through it, you can tell a lot of stories about the places that people live through it. You can also tell the story of the making of British society through the Commonwealth links, but I don't think we know about them, actually, in our society. I think if you took 14-year-olds um, in a school here in Birmingham, took people from ethnic minority backgrounds, would they know that there's quite a likely chance that their extended families were fighting for Britain from far abroad? If you took um, white children in Birmingham, would they know that story about those Commonwealth links? So I think we should find ways to bring people together. You know, if we think about that um, centenary of the First World War, think about Remembrance Sunday maybe in uh, 2014, should it be just another Sunday where Arsenal play Manchester United? on the telly, the shops are open and everything else, or should we actually find different ways to market and then make sure we use it to say, do we tell enough of our own history? Do we learn enough of our own history in schools? Do we know our, enough of our own history in society? Because I think, I think history is a very important uh, route to shared Britishness. I think what New Labour got wrong in the Millennium Dome was this, they felt that you had to, be, you had to let go of your traditions to be a modern country. You've then got nothing to say. You build a dome and you've got nothing to put in it. It's always been an absolute mythology that people from minority backgrounds will be worried if you're proud of Shakespeare. So if you go to schools in the Commonwealth, they'll be teaching a lot more Shakespeare than they sometimes have been in schools in Britain. So using our shared history, using our shared culture, showing that Britain, British identity is an identity that's had an ability to um, absorb, adapt, change as it does, um, I think it's very important. But if we use our national moments to do that as we did, in 
this Olympic year, I think, would give people more confidence that they can share a future, partly because they've shared more history than they sometimes realise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sundar. Uh, great stuff. Good pop up. Great. Thank you. Thank you to Mrs. Pumbika for inviting me to speak this evening. In fact, uh, this is my first time I'm speaking to Contest. I've been to Contest for the last many years. This is a great privilege to, to talk about uh, immigration and integration. <coughs> but before I start with that, let, let me talk about the British Indian immigrants in this country. 1.6 million, roughly, according to the latest um, census. Of those, I would say 60% are born in the UK. Um, they're more likely to be employed or self-employed than unemployed. The lowest prison population in the UK. Uh, they probably contribute about 6% of GDP, with less than 2% of the population. I would say roughly about half the children go to the top 12 universities, so they focus on education as well. 94% house ownership. So they are in many ways a success story, Operation News. And I'll tell you why later on, why they are probably more successful than maybe other immigrants in this country. But let me talk about a little bit about myself. I was introduced as someone who came from, from Uganda. Um, I came in 1971 when I was 16, 16 17, bitten and tortured by that uh, brutal dictator Idi Amin. And 18 months later, 35,000 Ugandans were kicked out. Uh, the Kenyan and Tanzanians closed the border. Mrs. Gandhi, if you remember, didn't want them. As this country, you get them compassionate welcome. Partly, out of compassion, but partly they also had British protected passport. In other words, they were protected by Britain, but they didn't have right to abort. And it was Ted Heath government, the Conservative government at the time, who obviously gave them a warm welcome. And I was by then 18, working at Stansted as a volunteer to so give them that welcome. There were a large number of voluntary organizations um, uh, helping them to sort of settle down or bring them to camps. And next day we had teachers and headmasters who enrolled the children to school and the doctors who registered them and their career advisors and and Damon you won't believe believe the career advisor came to see me, he said they all want to be shopkeepers. So, <laughs> and they did become shopkeepers. In those days there was a joke in England, what is an Indian without a shop? And the answer was doctor. <laughs> so, that's uh, very good. And this is this, this community, the Uganda nation who came here. There are six, sorry, five parliamentarians, four in the House of Lords, and one Saileshwara in the House of Commons. Four conservative, one Labour, one Liberal, one sorry, cross bench. So, the reason they are successful is because they integrated very well. And the reason we had to integrate, we were very lucky that we had no guidance from Board of Jewish Deputies, how the Jewish immigration took place some years ago. So we, they guided us very well. We realized that we've got to integrate, we've got to educate our children, and by through education, we'll make sure they get a job, <clears throat> and by having a job, they'll make a success of their family and their community and their country. A lot of them went into business and made successful, you know, huge success. So they're very patriotic, very philanthropic, and settled very, very well in this country. But what surprised me when I was canvassing in, in the two, 20, sorry, 2005 election, 2010 election in Harrow, where I come from, and Harrow is roughly about 35,000, 35% of Harrow is um, Indian population, predominantly Hindu or Sikh. And they have this slogan, proud to be Hindu, proud to be British, proud to be Sikh, proud to be British. But they take that pride in this country, because this country has done so much for them and their children. Not just making money and the British values, but a great education for the children. And that's something they do appreciate. But I was quite taken back then. And when I spoke to, when I was canvassing in 20, uh, 2005 and 2010 election, it was this very immigrants who were saying, we don't want any more immigration. It's too much. Can we do something to stop it? And I was taken back and I realized why they were saying it. You know. So I have talked about um, Uganda. I have talked about... Uh, the British Indians. Um, of course, it's very important that, that we carry British identity. I wish we had, like Americans will say, I'm proud to be American, and no matter where they come from, we should carry that, that's definitely, that identity to proud to be British. 
held that hallmark, held that brand of Britain. And we saw that during the Olympic time, very inclusive, people of many races so working together and make that, made that game a very success story. I think I'll stop here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, if that was your first conference speech, it won't be your last. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, what I'd like to do is now ask some serious questions. I think the interesting, uh, the first one to ask is, what is a successful integration strategy? Because not all groups integrate at the same level, at the same pace, and not all groups integrate well. So what I'd like to do is ask, ask our panellists what they feel a successful integration strategy must have. And if they could also point out what they feel is an unsuccessful immigration strategy, I'd be really grateful. So Damien, first of all. I think that the root of it has to lie in numbers. Uh, what, one of the, because I wasn't just immigration minister for two and a half years, I shadowed it for five years. <coughs> And one of the silliest things ever said to me by uh, one of Labour's numerous immigration ministers uh, was he accused me of playing a numbers game. Well, I'm sorry, immigration is a numbers game. That if 10,000 people a year arrived in this country, it would, be, it would be not be a political issue at all. If a million people a year arrived in this country, it would be the only political issue that mattered uh, in this country. And actually, if you want to have a successful integration strategy, then you have to start by changing society at a pace that society can cope with. And that, that is the purpose uh, of this government's uh, immigration uh, policy, the, the, the tens of thousands a year. It's, you know, it still allows a lot, it allows skilled people in, it will allow the brightest and best students in, but it will also allow communities to adapt so that all the benefits that you know, all three of us have talked about, and, and many people in this room will recognise, can continue to be had without the social stresses and strains that, uh, that we've seen. So, so that's, that's one thing. And, and the second thing is um, a sort of willingness on the part of those coming here, I would assume the, the, those who came from Uganda are the absolutely prime example, um, actually to, to get on with their lives uh, within the context of the country they've come to. And, and Sunder's right, of course, if you, if you have voluntarily committed yourself to living and bringing up your children in another country, then there is something perverse about the idea that you reject the values of that country. So the overwhelming majority of people will want to do this. Um, and what it requires from the host community is encouragement to do that and help to do that. But also, I think, quite a strict rejection of those who say, and you know, we see this in some, you know, a small number, but a very noisy small number of, of Islamist extremists to say, uh, we, we want to live in your country, we want all the rights of freedom, and we want to use those free rights to reject all the values of your society. Now, no democracy, no society, can permit that sort of attitude to permeate large numbers of people in its society. Thank you very much. Um, two key and, and concise points. Uh, Sunda. Just what, what does integration involve? In a way, there's been a sort of long-running debate about is it socioeconomic inclusion and inequality, is it subjective and cultural belonging? And I, I think it's obvious that it has to be both. Because if you don't have sort of equal opportunity as something you're driving for, then um, then you, you you won't get there in the end. But it's not enough, I think, to have equal opportunity and then be indifferent as to how people feel about it. So I think the sort of subjective question: Do I feel that I belong here? And actually, equally important: Do other people treat me as though I belong equally? If I am a person who wants to contribute and play by the rules, do I count? That's quite important. So. Um, you, you've got to do both. I mean, to take, take an example, we've probably done you know, not enough, I think, on the integration identity front, although we've done it quite well in society. We haven't really had policy. France is very, very good at sort of flying flags from uh, town halls and saying there is one sort of republic, but actually they connect no data on uh, anything to do with anything like ethnicity because it would be sort of un-French and un-Republican to do that. So they don't know how it's going. And the fact is it isn't going very well. And so if you then say, well, you all should be very proud to be French, but actually there's sort of a level of discrimination, say, in people applying for jobs, you know, would never get an interview because their name sounds wrong. 
then people will at that point reject the kind of great values of the universal republic that they're being asked to join up to. And actually, you know, we've been better at that. But there's a sort of happy medium between the two. So I think it has to be both. So in that sense, discrimination itself is actually a barrier to integration. And so is that sort of view that, you know, however much you do play by the rules, you'll never quite count. And I think British identity has now, you know, <coughs> at the end of this sort of long and quite anxious period, proved to be really quite good at, you know, being inclusive of everybody who plays by the rules. I agree with what Damien says, actually, about numbers in that, I mean, in a way, I would say it's not so much the numbers as the pace of change. You know, a large number over a, over a longer time. But also, the reason it's not entirely about numbers, I mean, my, my father arrived here two weeks uh, after Enoch Powell's famous Rivers of Blood speech uh, came here from India to be not about to speak, obviously, it hadn't been well enough reported in India to, uh, to, to persuade him not to come. But actually, Powell was exactly right about the numbers and was saying things that people would find very scary. Four million, who can imagine it? And of course, if you had four million people who had entirely no sense of loyalty or belonging, as he said, you know, these people, if they're born here, people like me will never feel British, um, then it would be a massive problem. But actually, four million people who are part of the whole society are, are contributing like everybody else. And it's harder to do that if the scale and pace of change is too fast. But it's also important to recognise that it does happen, and the story of British history is of it happening, as long as we don't get things in the way. The sort of extreme Islamists are a big problem, and they're a big problem as well, because they lead to a sort of bit of a group libel on, you know, you know, 12 people say we're going to burn poppies, then you get front pages saying Muslims are going to burn poppies, and you never hear from the sort of vast, moderate majority of people who never dream of burning, burning a poppy and go around wearing one. So they're sort of as unrepresentative as the BNP and the EDL are. But it's much, much harder, I think, to explain how unrepresentative they are if we don't give proper voice to the people who are more mainstream. Thank you so much. Well, it's in fact a success story and uh, not successful. I mean, what I would say, if people want to be successful, they must adopt and accept British of life. They must re accept, adopt and accept British of life. And Britain, in many ways, do embrace our culture and our religion. They don't stop us from doing that. And this is the people who are not successful because they tend to bring their own culture and other things from their own country. One of the reasons they left the country they come from was the very reason they didn't have the freedom to do so. And I hear now. If you don't accept and adopt the British of life, I'm afraid you will not be successful. And if you do, you will be successful in it. And you'll move on in life. But most important you'll pass this your children and grandchildren, who obviously learn to respect the country that they live in, the country that they were adopted as their mothers. Sure. So I, I, sorry, the one thing I didn't say, which um, almost goes without saying, but should never go without saying, is language. If you want to be successfully integrated, you have to learn the language. And <laughs> it, that's, that's another aspect of, of government policy. Uh, we, you know, we, we have now started interviewing people uh, again, this has stopped about uh, 10 years ago. So the people who come here claiming to want to study who can't speak English properly won't be allowed in because if you can't speak English properly, you're never going to integrate properly. Thank you. I mean, I think sort of one of the interesting things about Britain and, and almost all of my sort of you know, non-white friends who travel across Europe, I think would concur with this, is in Europe, it's the best place to be non-white. It's the, because quite simply, what Britain has is a civic identity. Britain has never had a blood account of what it is. And what I think is very problematic and interesting in the French accounts, and if you look at French post-colonial history, it's a disaster, Vietnam, Algeria, Cambodia. But it seemed like it was good because they landed and said, you are all French, you are like us. And what I think is interesting in Britain is we allow people who come to us to move our account of Britishness, to broaden what it is to be British. And I think and I think that, that is not talked upon, but it sort of has created, really, the best country in Europe, I would argue, for, for integration. Because the French won't let anyone else be French. You know, the Italians it can be very hostile, and you, you found this throughout Europe. But anyway, let's turn this uh, out to, to the audience for questions. So may, may I have questions? If you could say who you are, please. Uh, uh, first you, sir, then you. Thank you 
we just activating the microphone. Well done, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, does it work? Yes. Uh, Keith Best, uh, Chief Executive of Freedom T from Torture, but uh, as Damien knows, for 16 years was Chief Executive of the Immigration Advisory Service. Um, it won't surprise uh, many people who know me to realise that I support much of what has been said by the three panel members. But I think we need to bear in mind that British culture in itself is essentially evolving all the time. And yes, partly that is evolving as a result of immigration and other influences coming in. And Britain has actually been quite successful in uh, adopting and adapting to those different cultures uh, com coming in. For me, integration is all about participation. And I think those communities, such as the Indian community, have been most successful, are the ones who have shown the maximum degree of participation. But I think the rest of us should uh, not be surprised if that participation then leads to criticism of our own culture and the way we run things and things like this, and therefore leads on to the evolution. And, and the only difficulty I have with, with Damien's view about the language uh, is that, of course, the best place to learn the English language is the UK. Uh, it, it's, it's no good saying to people in countries where English is not widely spoken, uh, you need to learn English before you come here. And this country has been particularly good at bringing in people who don't actually speak English as their first language, but who have then adapted to that once they've arrived in this country. And I think it will be a very, very sad moment if we are actually excluding people, notwithstanding the issues of whether it's right to actually, uh, the government should say, I should not marry somebody from a foreign country because they cannot speak English and therefore allow them to move in with me into this country. But I think we have to be a lot more inventive okay. about some of these issues. Thank you very much. The gentleman next to you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Roger Elkins, a uh, councillor in, uh, in Arran in, in Sussex. Um, I think we're all, we can all see in our day-to-day -day lives the, uh, many of our um, Europeans who have actually come and play a very active role in our community. Many have a very high work ethic uh, within our community and, and that clearly we see in, in, in many of our service industries. But coming to this conference, I spoke to uh, a number of my local members and said, you know, what are the issues that you would like me to ask? And it's, it's not about, no surprise, it's not about green energy, it's about immigration. And some of the points that have been uh, highlighted here this evening is they feel that um, many of the immigrants do not integrate and that clearly have a very, very different cultural lifestyle. And they feel that isn't being addressed. And there isn't really a strong resolve to address some of those issues. And therefore that makes them feel very uncomfortable in their local community. So it may be people sitting on their front lawns, drinking during the afternoons and in the evenings, it's not a normal cultural element of the UK. They may be sitting on their front steps, again, and people find that somewhat intimidating. Equally, they often do not um, have the language benefit, and therefore they maintain their own language. Their working is often involved with gang masters, and there are other issues which the police may deal with. So, those are the issues that they, we've always been very, very accommodating, um, but that makes them feel uncomfortable and therefore it, it's a challenge for them to integrate. So the community doesn't therefore feel comfortable, in, even if it's only out shopping, um, you know, they, they don't easily adopt people from, from those cultures. Um, so there are many that do, but that's the question I want to raise, how can we address that and I know the police have looked at some issues, but they don't feel that those issues are being addressed. No, and, I, and I thank you. Immigration, and, and Sunder made this point, immigration isn't easy, and we shouldn't avoid 
the, the difficult points that people feel marginalised in their own communities. So if we do, we only foster. So thank you for raising that. Um, there was another question in front. Uh, the lady there, thank you very much. Nice skipping there, Andrew. Well done. Anita Mesa, Watford Conservative Future. Um, building on both those questions, and I'm glad Damien did bring up the issue of language, how are we going to make sure those that are in our society at the moment and have failed to learn the language aren't going to become disengaged or aren't going to be disengaged forever? How can we make sure that they are going to be able to learn our language and become true British members of society? Thank you very much. So what I suggest is if you just to answer the question that you would like, uh, I'll begin with you, uh, Lord Popper. Sure, in fact, um, I'll go on. I, I agree with what Keith Best is saying. Um, <coughs> my own view is that those who go here should make efforts to, to intermingle and become part of British society. It's important that, as Damon mentioned earlier, that they have good knowledge of the English language. It is unfortunate the immigration that we've we've had in the last 15 years, we have a large number of new immigrants who have problems of the language. Some of them come from Eastern Europe as well. The language is crucial, and I, I would fully support the government if there were English classes available to these people. But well, quite often we can impose that request to the people, the workforce, the employers, the private sector to help their employees to learn English. If they do learn English, will be able to communicate well with the children. In, in some of the cases, the children are UK born and they go to school, and quite often they speak only one language, and that's English. So without knowing the language, it is so difficult to integrate. So I think language will come number one. A second thing, what's important, is quite often to educate and explain our values, what we stand for, who we are, how you as an immigrant can make a success for your own life and the life of your children, by intermingling, integrating as well. Thank you very much. On the, on, the, on the question of difficulties, I mean, I think, clear boundaries are quite important, but another reason that makes it more difficult is that immigration is changing. And we have the model where, you know, you arrive on the Windrush boat or the people arrive at the airport in 1971, but now there's also some short-term immigration, much more of it, people who are not planning. So people don't even notice that. Now, that's quite a complex kind of happen actually but we should ask why it's happening sometimes it's middle class parents saying become a doctor don't mess about on the football pitch but it isn't only that actually it is that uh, you know poorer Asian kids who might treat it as a pattern probably aren't being picked up by the sort of scouting networks and so on so I think there are gaps and also another another gap for us is that you know if Mo Fowler is British and we all celebrate that is he English because actually Englishness is going to emerge. And if, if the UK broke up tomorrow, which will be 2014, about Sandwich, I think it would be a great shame. Uh, Scottish identity is now quite civic, quite inclusive, quite multi-ethnic. Uh, English identity, it's much less clear whether we've done that. We've done it in the British sphere and not in the English sphere. It's not true of our cricket team or our football team, but these are, these are, this is an identity we only have. So we've actually got more work to do there as well. So it's always a two-way street. And the important thing, the important thing is this point about how you're moving into something that's changed. So to stand up to our values now and to obey our values and be us, you have to not be racist at football grounds and accept that gay people have equal rights. I'm really pleased about that, but both of those things have become true in the last 15 years. And so it's, it's actually... But our language hasn't caught up, so being integral to our society is a good thing. But we're not turning you into a sort of 1950s Englishman. We're integrating you into modern London, modern Birmingham, modern Manchester. There's a lot more space in it than it was because that gets created. So we can insist on integration because it's a changing because it's a changing shape that you get to shape. But we should be we should be aware that we've changed the rules quite recently. And we've changed the rules in a profoundly good way. But actually we, we you know we, we sometimes have got a bit more to do than we think. That's great, thanks for that. And let me just add yeah. much point directly because it's it's really important and, 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 and trust me you, you don't get suddenly you don't get um, complacent about uh, attitudes to immigration uh, if you deal with immigration for more than seven years like I have because I've had the emails and the letters from people uh, for seven years now so I know what people out there are thinking um, and some of it's very very profoundly uh, uneasy with, with what's gone on and I think I mean, the answer oddly enough is, is, is quite simply that we need to enforce the law and we need to not uh, if it is you know, it will be a civic bylaw no doubt in, in peaceful Sussex towns 
that actually you know, getting drunk and lounging around on the pavements all afternoon is not allowed. And indeed, one of the changes we've made in the last few years is that what became a sort of drinking culture in public, some cities have now decided to make illegal. I think Coventry started the way. They just stopped bunches of kids sitting in parks getting drunk in the afternoon. Now, if it is part of your culture in, in some other country to do that, and you want to do it in this country, and it's against the local bylaws, then tough. You know, just as Brits who go to the parts of the Middle East can't drink in public or in some places in private, you know, that's the price you pay for wanting to go and live there. Uh, and, and similarly, I think you know, there are prices you pay if, if you think it's, it's normal and sociable and great to get you know, drunk on your front porch uh, every afternoon, then you know, we should stop it. And we need to have the self-confidence as a society, I think, where this intersects with public policy, is if we start saying, oh, well, that's their culture, so we should allow it, then at that point you get the unease that you identify. If most people in the community say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want that happening in my community, uh, then we should have the self-confidence to do it. And that is a, a, a profoundly <coughs> anti-racist point. I remember literally the first ever visit I did, a shadow immigration minister, was to Coventry, and I went to the Coventry Muslim Resource Centre, and for half an hour I was assailed uh, by people saying, it's outrageous the way these people are coming here uh, and changing, you know, they are behaving in a way that we don't find acceptable in this country. And everyone saying this was an elderly man with a beard, you know, he was the elders of the Coventry Muslim community, and what they were complaining about was people from a particular Eastern European country I won't name, um, but, but they'd all moved into the area and they all got drunk, they pinched girls' bums, they wolf whistled, they did things that these people found profoundly un-British and unacceptable in their local community. So actually across various ethnic communities there is quite a, a strength of feeling about decent civic behaviour and we should just have a self-confidence as a society and if necessary, pass laws to enforce it, to say, okay, if it, yeah, we don't think this behaviour is acceptable, so you're not going to be allowed to do it, and we don't care uh, where you come from. In Britain, you don't do this. Thank you very much. In the last round of questions, I'd like us to get a bit harder. Let's ask some of the hard questions about immigration, and then I'll wind it, I'll wind it up. So uh, I'll take uh, the gentleman there, because you asked earlier. We have the, the, if we could be really quick, I'll try and get them all in. So if you can actually make it a question, not a comment. Gentleman there, just, yeah, and then the gentleman behind you, go on. Hey, um, Philip Trade, University of Warwick Conservative Society. Um, last summer, last year, um, the London riots kind of completely shocked the country for about a week. And then there's almost the feeling that as an issue it got swept under the country, under the, country, under the carpet. And um, I mean, Theresa May just referred to it kind of as acts of sheer criminality. But looking at the reports on TV, it was notable that there were a lot of kind of non-white people out there protesting. And I was wondering what, what the panel thought about whether it reflects a failure of integration, whether it's you know, different ethnic backgrounds feeling dissatisfied with lacks of career opportunities and stuff. Great question. Short, sharp, hard. That's what we want. Gentleman behind you. Uh, I've always been uh, in favour of... Yourself. Sorry, I'm Adrian Bailey from Birmingham Humanists. I've always been pro-European. But one problem these days is you can see mostly white Europeans have no restriction on coming to Britain. Whereas mostly non-white, non-Europeans are restricted. And this appears to be a somewhat racist situation. Brilliant. Uh, another question from the lady back there. If we can keep it this short, this will be marvellous. Lady? My name is Joanna McIlhatton from Wallasey and Wirral. Um, Damien has uh, touched on the point I was going to raise. What happens to people who come to Britain as immigrants because they just prefer to live in Britain, but they don't want to in integrate into our way of life, and they've no intentions of becoming British. Um, what, what happens to these people? They keep their heads down so they're not breaking the law. You're but... talking about bankers, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, very wise. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, gentlemen behind you, right to the back. I think that's a Mr. Goodhart. Hello, David Goodhart. I'm the director of Demos. If you could go back 50 years and just do change one major policy to make Britain today a more integrated society, what would you do? Excellent. Uh, gentleman down at the front, 
I'm just collecting them all because this is the last round, and then I'll ask colleagues on the panel to answer the questions that they're most excited about. Hello, Mike Dark is Lincoln. Um, one thing I'm particularly concerned about, and I'd like uh, the panel to uh, discuss this, is when people want to integrate, but there is pressure from their parents, maybe the second or third generation immigrants, not to, and this of course has its extreme manifestation in so-called honour killings, which we've had quite a lot of. Um, what is the government going to can do about that? Thank you very much, sir. And uh, the gentleman just there. Hello, my name is Colin Crozier and I'm chairman of Hexham Constituency Conservative Future. Would the panel agree that we must use strategies through education to reduce the amount of racial division between different communities and also not only educate for the syllabus but also put it as teachers' responsibilities to make sure that there is racial integration not only in the classroom but on the playground? Thank you very much. Any others? Uh, last one there. I'm just very proud that I've managed to capture all the questions because everyone's been short. Hi, Michael Timmins, uh, Warwick University as well. Uh, my question is sort of more specifically to Damien's point about uh, not letting people come, come to the country and sort of disobey the law and sort of act in their own way. What would you say when this sort of comes into conflict with, say, religious practices which come close to disobeying our laws, for example, the wearing of a veil or carrying around sort of weapons which would be religious traditions in their country but perhaps not in ours? Thank you very much. And if I could add just one question... Immigration uh, doesn't produce just winners. Um, I actually think immigration, particularly low-skill immigration, produces a lot of losers, particularly for indi the indigenous community who, who often feel that their routes to economic well-being or jobs are cut off by well-educated Europeans or low-skill to accept lower wages. And in the northwest, go through Burnley, go through those cotton towns, it's not a good situation. What can we do for those people? Okay, so I'll ask you, you don't have to respond to them all, just respond to whatever questions strike you. Sunder. Um, let me take the one about um, honour killings and, and parental pressure. Generally, I mean, first thing to say about honour killings is that I think it's an absolutely you know, hateful term. And it'd be quite good, you know, maybe government and media and other people could do this. You know, why the hell do we use it? We should find a, you find a different term. You're almost sort of like empathising with the perpetrator of, you know, killing your own children. Uh, to take the worst case by sort of uh, sort of giving it a giving it a motive, um, so you know, and the you know the idea that it represents a tradition that's widely held. I mean, it's you know, uh, you know, it's a truly terrible thing. Uh, and opposed now, take a less dramatic case. Older members of minority communities feel quite similarly to older members of majority communities. They wonder if the traditions that they hold dear are not going to be kept up by their children and grandchildren. That's the sort of natural anxiety people feel. The answer is you don't get to choose what your children and grandchildren do. And so the answer to the question is to sort of educate 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds and 16-year-olds if they need to sort of have the confidence to sort of argue with their parents about what they want to study, who they want to marry, where they, you know, where they want to go, that they do that. And that's true of all communities. I mean, I, I am, uh, I'm only here, actually, because my, my dad uh, sort of disagreed with his dad about who he should marry and decided to come over here instead. So I have a sort of emotional attachment to that side of the that side of the argument as you do when you're watching a sort of uh, Jane Austen movie or, or whatever but um, I mean, the, the issue there is that is that in the end uh, you've got to you've got to have the kind of the confidence to make the choices and not the question it's fine to you know outlaw forced marriage which will already be illegal and the, dif the difficulty is where there is coercive pressure that is not you know, doing anything actually illegal, how you get the cultural okay. change to do it. Because I think one other thing about integration, uh, Philip, which is that integration, you know, requires, is a two-way street. And it also requires the majority community to mix and to integrate. If you get white flight, you get less integration, not necessarily because of what the minority thought. This is what I thought went wrong with multiculturalism, is that the majority community thought that was something ethnic minorities would do on their own. But if it's going to reshape the national identity, you can't have ethnic minorities deciding they've got a new national identity. Okay, and, and uh, in response to David Goodhart's point, one sentence, anything you'd changed in the last 50 years? Well, I think, I mean, there, you know, there are lots of things we should change, but I, I think, uh, you know, that we might change with hindsight. I think we've got some very important things right in that actually our commitment to sort of anti-discrimination, which wasn't okay, very strong at the start, 
that's actually got stronger over time. That's a very good point. Look, I think what's changed in the last 50 years, 50 years ago, uh, if you're not white, you're immigrant. That's no longer the case. And 50 years ago, um, you had to be white and Christian to be British, and that's not the case anymore. So that's an advantage, in fact. Things have changed in 50 years, anyway. If I go back to some of the questions asked here about um, parents that don't encourage the children to integrate, and frankly, I've seen this. I, I, I've been to Brexit, for example, and these are third generation immigrants having difficulty finding jobs because they're not integrated so well. Partly, they don't have the education either to find a job. And they still walk in the normal, traditional clothes they will wear where they come from. I think that's, it is their loss. But the parents don't realize the damage they've done to the children. It's their own loss. Then I met other immigrants who are probably second generation, you know, people like my children who are educated, easy, find a job in the city, no problems. They're so what integrated, their friends are integrated, some of my nieces and nephews are now married to white British, girls or boys. And, and the life they enjoy in this country, the benefits they receive in the life they enjoy in this country. So I think those parents are doing damage to their own children. In the long term, given time, I think there are real difficulty um, you know, in finding jobs and settling down and enjoy high living standards. In many ways, I think we should adopt um, the Australian <laughs> immigration policy. Australian, I mean, we've done, them as they've done a good job as English is compulsory. But in Australia, they tell immigrants, wow, welcome, good luck, the all the pushes, go for it, you are an Australian. If there are things you don't like about a country, or if you don't respect their values, and you want to demonstrate the things that is against the wishes of the Australian people, then I'm afraid you're in the wrong country. The fact you came here in the first place is because you're not happy with the country you come from. So if you don't like what the Australians do, this is the wrong country to be in. So they have a superb immigration policy, I would say. Um, and, and if I were to ask you, if there was one thing you could change in the last 50 years, uh, what might that be? I, I said earlier, I said promote British brand. That brand carries a lot of weight. Remember, you know, half the world was ruled by us. Look at Commonwealth. I traveled to many Commonwealth countries, particularly Africa, and they're so proud of Britain being the country that was ruling them. That's, there's very much want to engage with us all the time. They want to do trade with us. If you look at the language, I, I came back from Uganda four months ago. I went out for 41 years. And I was surprised. When I was there, there was tribalism there. Like in Kenya then. Kenya has been let down because of tribalism. Uganda had a huge problem with tribalism. Having gone through dictatorship and civil war, 24 years of democracy helped by us with the World Bank. The tribalism is, is gone. They speak one language, English, not like the way we do. They speak Queen's English. And the country has done superbly well. So if you ask me what will we do, promote the British brand, it, it's a great value. You saw from the Olympic, you saw from the um, Diamond Jubilee celebration, the whole world were watching. They love us, they like us. As an immigrant, I'm here because I love this country and the people of this country. Well, all hail to that. Thank you, thank you uh, so much. Jamie. Let me try and race through as many as I can. Uh, the riots, were they sort of ethically based? I think most of the evidence is that a, a lot of it was, was criminal gangs, basically, organising low-level criminality, uh, some of whom were ethically based, some of whom were just geographically based. Uh, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like 81, I think it's, 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 it's the key thing. Uh, why it, it is allowing Europeans to come here to be racist? No. Uh, you, know, you can be French, Afro-Caribbean French, uh, Muslim, things like that, you still have the absolute right to come to this country under free movement, so, so it's not a, a, a racist policy at all. Uh, what happens to people who, who prefer to be here and not integrate? I, I mean, if, they, if they're working, if they're able to speak English, uh, if they're not milking the system, then, as it were, treat them like, like any Brits. Um, they, they won't get on very well. I mean, Paul Popper is completely right. Um, unless they integrate and accept a large number of, of, of British values. So in the end, uh, we need to ensure that people can't uh, manipulate the welfare system uh, and so on. That's the best way to make sure they, uh, they, they come through. Uh, should we use education to reduce uh, racial tensions, racial divisions? 
Um, absolutely, but I'm, I'm very, very wary on putting new burdens on teachers. You know, I think teachers have a lot of burdens already, and what I want teachers to do is to make sure uh, that kids can read, write, count, and, and communicate. Uh, and if they've got those basic skills, then actually they're much more likely to integrate because they will be uh, successful citizens. Uh, religious either at a close or saying disobeying the law. It's quite difficult to disobey the law, just what you wear. Uh, I, I absolutely wouldn't ban the burqa or anything like that. Uh, I think in fact that would be un-British uh, because it would be showing a degree of intolerance. But absolutely, if anyone's carrying a weapon uh, that, that you, know, you wouldn't be allowed to carry if you were not of a particular ethnic or religious background, then it's just illegal. It's the weapon that's illegal. Uh, and and you know, as I said earlier, uh, the law needs to apply to everyone. Um, what do we do about unskilled immigrants? I don't think we need unskilled uh, immigrants coming to this country. Uh, and indeed, we don't allow them. We have a quota for them, and that quota is zero. Uh, so uh, that seems to be sensible. It was uh, one of previous government's policies, which we've carried on. And, and David Goodhart's a uh, very good question, which I do want to answer, not least because I shamelessly nicked uh, his phrase about Britain becoming addicted to immigration uh, under the previous government, and you used it a lot. Uh, so thank you, David, for that phrase. It was exactly right and, and quite vivid. Uh, I, I think two things. Uh, first of all, uh, and, and this is one mistake I think made by a Conservative government and one mistake made by a Labour government, I would have been a lot more receptive of the Hong Kong Chinese. I would have loved to have had 20 or 30,000 Hong Kong Chinese uh, in this country. Uh, actually, I think they'd have been as successful uh, as your community and regenerated large parts of this country. And I absolutely wouldn't have uh, relaxed the policy in 1997 uh, as the, the incoming Labour government did. Uh, Ian, this is not a partisan point, it's a factual point. You look at uh, the numbers of people coming to this country and it was like turning the tap on after 1997. And, and that's why we're having discussions about immigration now, is for 10 years the numbers coming in were so great that it re-became a toxic political issue. It hadn't been in the 80s and 90s, it became so again. So uh, I think there have been uh, mistakes on both sides, but that in particular, that last one, I would have not done. That was most impressive. Um, um, thank you, Damien. So to answer, I'd like to answer David's question. I would have not changed the basis of housing policy in the inner city from longevity to need, because I think that's set immigrant communities against white working class communities. Um, so on that note, um, I was concerned about no skilled labour in terms of European. They, oh. you know, they're out competing what we do for them. But can I just thank, fantastic, fantastic fringe, and thank you Philip, Damien, Philip. thank you Lord Poppet. Yeah. Oh Yo, yes, of course you can. Yeah, go on. Absolutely, David. Appropriately, in a, in a, at a conservative gathering, um, it wouldn't be possible any longer now because it would probably be illegal. But Edward Boyle, when he was education minister in 1963, when Edward Boyle was Harold Macmillan's education secretary in 1963, proposed that all schools should have a 30% minority ceiling, or it may be 40%. Yeah. Um, now, uh, as I say, it would probably be illegal today, um, and you know, it, it would be impossible to apply it. But I mean, I think Bradford, Tower Hamlets, Oldham, lots of these places would not be as, as dramatically segregated as they are if we had intervened in schools in that way. It was, I, I, I don't know why it didn't happen, just, just um, back, but it didn't happen. Just to back that up, I was at a working group at DCLG a couple of weeks ago, we had two academics present us uh, pro uh, the, the prognosis and essentially they argued the whole of the state school system in, in inner city London would tip into be purely ethnic minority precisely because once it hits 40% it's a tipping point and there's white flight and then you get a capture as they phrased it of that whole system by one ethnic group and that leads to those sort of tensions. So it's a very interesting point, I think. Can I just thank you all? It's been a fabulous debate. Thank you again, Jamie. We have another magnificent fringe uh, uh, scenario and events tomorrow. Uh, the leaflets are on your chairs and as you go out. And thank you for coming to the rest of Public of Fringe. Have a lovely evening.